Today, you're gonna learn three things. Number one, the justice system is very unpredictable. Number two, this man was an offspring of Satan himself. And number three, wrap your child up in cotton wool and never let them leave the house. If you wanna know why, stick around and let me introduce you to the name Pedro Alonso Lopez will never be forgotten for as long as we live. This crazed man abducted, abused and killed near 300 young girls in South America and was labelled the worst serial killer of all time. And for a good reason. Somehow, this guy is a free man as we speak, probably having a beer at his local pub, but most likely adding to his list of victims. You may be wondering, how does someone get away with taking the lives of 300 people over a span of 30 years? Well, lucky for you, I've done my homework and in today's video, I'm going to be taking you through the biggest mistake in the history of the justice system. I have to warn you that this story does include very disturbing details and as you can expect, there are some mind-blowing plot twists. So, viewer discretion is advised. Before we get into today's video, if you're a fan of true crime, you're in luck because that's what we do all the time. So if that's what you're into, please like this video, subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell because we upload every single day. Now, let's get into it. Pedro was born in October 1948 in the quiet town of Santa Isabel in Colombia, known for its shielded volcano. During his childhood, a lot of bad luck erupted around him, so he had a very tough and unusual upbringing to say the least. He had 12 siblings and was said to be a polite boy who dreamed of being a teacher according to his mother, Benilde Lopez. It turns out that this aged like milk if we think about his choice of victim. There's reasons why Pedro turned into the monster he's known as today. Pedro's father, Morado Reyes, was a member of the country's right-wing party and during the 10-year-long civil war at the time, he was shot and killed three months before Pedro was born, leaving him to be raised by Benilda Lopez, a penniless prostitute. No offence, Benilda. His one and only parent was physically abusive and he said that from a young age, he'd be forced to watch his mother with her clients at the place he was meant to feel safest at, which was his home and occasionally, this turned abusive. After watching his mother for many years, in 1957, Pedro grew curious and took this to extreme levels with his younger sister. His mother walked in and saw what he was doing and exiled him to the streets with a strong order never to return home. So, the chance of a normal life slimmed even more for Pedro as he was now homeless at the age of eight. And just four days into his new life, he was approached by what seemed to be a kind stranger, offering shelter and food. His hopes for a warm bed and something to eat were shattered as he was lured into an abandoned building and taken advantage of for days on end. In a downward spiral, Pedro found himself joining a gang for protection in Bogota and they would battle for food and places to sleep. They were forced to live in harsh conditions and often took drugs like crack cocaine. There came a glimmer of hope for Pedro. An elderly, An elderly American, American couple stumbled, stumbled across a skeletal, skeletal Pedro, Pedro begging, begging for food, food on the streets of Bogota. Bogota. Traumatised by what they had seen, they offered Pedro a home to stay in where he was also enrolled in a school for local orphans. Soon after, Pedro's worst fear had struck again. Whilst at school, a male teacher had taken advantage of Pedro, making him the third person to do so before he even reached his teenage years. This was the final straw for Pedro. With his newfound anger, he stole some money from the school and ran away from home. Pedro would later speak on wanting vengeance for his suffering as a child. During this time, the country's civil war was becoming a thing of the past and the Cold War was coming to an end. Colombia was redeveloping itself with many factories slowly reopening. With minimal education and no skills in any trade, for the next six years, Pedro found himself committing petty crimes to survive. His main hustle was stealing cars and selling them to local chop shops. This all came to an end in 1969, where he was found guilty of multiple car thefts 
and sentenced to seven years in prison. The series of unfortunate events continue for Pedro because just two days into his sentence, he was brutally ganged by four other inmates, an event that he says deeply traumatized him. And to be fair to him, I think that would deeply traumatize most people. Following the attack, he swore to himself that this was gonna be the last time that anybody ever touched him and they were gonna pay. So in retaliation, he crafted a shank and spent the next two weeks individually hunting down and viciously slaughtering each of the men who had f***ed him. His first nine killings in jail were deemed as self-defense by the Colombian Justice Department, and it only added two years to his previous sentence. Now, Pedro's tasted blood for the first time with no real repercussions, and paired up with his unfortunate upbringing and the indisputable damage to his mind in prison, it's the perfect recipe for disaster. It's now 1978 and Pedro is a free man living in Peru. He quickly became a drifter, moving from place to place with no real fixed job or home. In Pedro's mind, Benilda was to blame and his hatred for women grew just as strong as his resentment did for children who lived a normal life. And this is where the monster was truly born. Upon his release, Pedro traveled widely throughout Peru, and this is where his newfound career of killing began. He started by stalking and killing an average of three young girls per week, totaling 100 throughout the region. Young girls were going missing left, right and center, and no one had the answer for it. During this time, he attempted to kidnap a nine-year-old girl from an Indian tribe in northern Peru, and this went horribly wrong for Pedro. He was stripped to his skin and tortured for hours on end. And on the brink of death, they buried him up to his neck and they had planned something truly horrifying. They started to pour syrup on his head and left him in the ground to be eaten by ants over the days to come. By some miracle, an American missionary lady who was passing by to spread her religious faith was shocked with what she had saw and she intervened before it was too late. She convinced the tribe that this was ungodly and demanded them to let her deliver him to the police. So the tribe reluctantly agreed and then set him free. As promised, Pedro was turned over to authorities. Little did she know her passenger was the worst serial killer to ever live in the prime of his years. Pedro later stated in an interview that he didn't want to harm her because she was too old for him. She drove Pedro to the Peruvian authorities and without truly considering the crimes that could have been inflicted upon the natives and the danger posed to society, they just deported him back to Colombia and he picked up where he left off. He targeted girls between the age of eight and 12, mostly from poor communities he had no real racial preference and was even tempted to kidnap Caucasian girls like foreign tourists but decided not to because they were more closely watched by their parents. He would generally, he would generally stalk, stalk girls for an unknown, unknown amount of time and kidnap, and then kidnap them. After he had them, he would take them to a secluded place where he would have his way with them before strangling them to death. He'd then bury their bodies in shallow graves, sometimes in groups of three or four. Before they decomposed too much, he would return and play sick games like tea parties with the dead little girls. If that wasn't frightening enough, all of his crimes were done in broad daylight because he wanted to have a clear view of his victims' faces as they drifted away. His exact words were, it was only good if I can see her eyes. It would have been wasted in the dark. I had to watch them by daylight. Authorities began to notice an increase in missing persons cases involving young girls, but assumed it was the slavery and prostitution rings that were growing at the time. So, Pedro continued to stay under the radar, and in the 70s, Pedro made his way to Ecuador, where the tally of young girls continued to rise. In 1979, a flash flood hit Ambato in Ecuador, and the bodies of four missing girls were revealed. Authorities grew even more suspicious as there was obvious foul play, but still no connection to Pedro. This all changed when just days later, Pedro attempted to abduct a 12 year old girl from a marketplace in Ambato, but was caught by the girl's mother this time. A group of passers-by helped detain Pedro with plans to lynch him in the middle of the market. However, police were called to the scene and he was arrested instead. When in police custody, he refused to cooperate with authorities and didn't answer a single question. 
Running out of options, they tried a new approach. Police recruited a local priest to help them crack Pedro, and it was only when Father Carbo de Gudinho pretended to be a fellow prisoner that he spoke of his crimes, and they were so horrific and disturbing, the priest asked to be relieved just one day later. After a follow-up interview with the priest, authorities confronted Pedro with their newfound evidence and he broke down. Pedro admitted to killing 110 in Ecuador, 100 in Colombia and over 100 more in Peru. Upon his confession, he said, I like the girls in Ecuador. They're more gentle and trusting, more innocent. He went on to say, there's a wonderful moment, a divine moment when I have my hands around a young girl's throat. I would look into her eyes and see a certain light, a spark, and it would suddenly go out. Only those who kill know what I mean. The moment of death is exciting, and someday, when I'm released, I will feel that moment again. I'll be happy to kill again. It's my mission. During the course of his confessions, he blamed his actions on his hard upbringing and explained that I lost my innocence at the age of eight, so I decided to do the same to as many young girls as I could. Police were disbelieving of Pedro's confession at first, as it was almost too horrifying to believe. But all the doubt vanished when Pedro led him to what he called his first dump site in Ambato, where they found the bodies of 53 girls aged 8 to 12. He led police to various other dump sites that day, but no further bodies were recovered. Coupled with these confessions, Pedro was charged with 110 murders, and he claims to be responsible for around 200 more in the neighboring countries of Peru and Colombia. Pedro only received a maximum sentence of 16 years, and he was incarcerated to serve his sentence. In January 99, whilst incarcerated, Pedro gave an exclusive one-time interview with the famous journalist Ron Leitner. The following words are snippets of what was said by Pedro in the interview. I'm the man of the century. No one will ever forget me. I went after my victims by walking among the markets, searching for a girl with a certain look on her face, a look of innocence and beauty. She would be a good girl working with her mother. I followed them sometimes for two or three days, waiting for them to be left alone. I would give them trinkets like hand mirrors and then take her to the edge of town where I would promise another one for her mother. I would take her to a secret hideaway where prepared graves waited. Sometimes there were bodies of earlier victims in there. I cuddled them and I reached them at sunrise. And at the first sign of light, I would get excited. I would force the girl into and then put my hands around her throat. When the sun rose, I would strangle her. It took the girls five to 15 minutes to die. I was always very considerate. I would spend a long time with them making sure they were dead. Sometimes I would have to kill them all over again. They never screamed because they didn't expect anything would happen. They were innocent. My little friends liked to have company, so I would often put three or four into a hole. After a while, I got bored because they couldn't move, so I started to look for more girls. He was later released from prison in August 94 on good behavior. An hour after his release, he was arrested again as an illegal immigrant and handed over to Colombian authorities. They charged him with a 20-year-old murder as a woman came forward claiming that she had seen Pedro walk away with her daughter before her body was found and strangled outside of town. The pattern of killing was identical to Pedro's no murders in Ecuador and with that observation, he was found guilty straight away. During the trial, he was declared insane and held in a psychiatric wing in Bogota Hospital instead of doing another prison sentence. In 1998, a new evaluation deemed him sane and he was released on just a $50 bail, subject to some conditions that never came into fruition as Pedro was never seen again. Interpol released an advisory of his arrest and with concerns having risen about his possible connection to a fresh 2002 murder. However, his current whereabouts remained unknown until this day. He is a wanted man as of today. Before we end this video, during my research, I stumbled across the following video. Let me know what you think. <laughs> Do you think that's Pedro? Let me know in the comments down below. 
Well, that wraps up today's story. If you found that one interesting, please like, subscribe and hit that notification bell and hopefully I'll see you in the next video.